This is the 18th season of Bass Talk Live. With your host, Matt Pangrad. BTL is brought to you by Moraine's Bass Cat Boats, Apco, Strike King Lures, Sunline, Big Bite Baits, Spro, X Zone Lures, Gamakatsu, The Bass Tank. Denali Rods and Pro Guide Batteries. PTL coming at you. Good morning and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where we are going to talk about bass fishing, the final regular show of the 2022 season. The first season solo without Mark Jeffries. We made it through, and I thought, what better way to end it? Then with one of my good buddies, and I'm going to call him a good buddy because, listen, I'll be honest. I've done this game a long time now. I started covering it. I started going to every single Elite Series and FLW tournament in 2008, and I went to every single Elite Series through the 2018 season, probably half of the FLWs, every cup, every classic. There's a lot of good guys in this sport. There really are. There's a lot of good guys in this sport. But then when you stop seeing people or you stop stop going or you stop writing articles or you stop doing stuff there's a lot of those guys that kind of fall off the map they don't call they don't say hey what's up without wanting something without wanting an article and there's nothing wrong with that i mean that's the industry i provide that through media through through writing through video uh through content on it but dude i'll tell you what throughout all the years and i don't get to see the cajun baby cliff crochet very much but, dude, he is one of the few guys, the handful of guys that I call a, a true friend who will call up just to chat. Usually it's to take a shot at Oklahoma or to talk about LSU or something. It might be after a tournament. It might be after one of my opens. But he always follows it up. And, listen, he's probably got more on his plate than 98% of the guys out there. We might get to see some of that this morning. He's in his kitchen in, I think they're still in Pierre Park, Louisiana. Is that a? Are you still in Pierre? Cliff? Yeah, Pierre Park. Born and raised, never leaving, ever, in the history of the world. I see so I hear some some clinking going on in the kitchen before. We had kids, we had dogs, we got all sorts of chaos going on. You have four boys under six, right? Seven. Seven. Four boys under seven. Seven, five, and there'll be three. The twins will be three in February. So everybody is talking, everybody has a personality, and everybody can also throw fists and a dog the dog seems like the calmest one out of the entire oh, family the unit dog. that you have here hey you talking about throwing fists but i'm doing the throw down like in a second instantly and then you ask him did you you hit your brother just said, yeah i hit him like, oh no. so they're just all about it yeah they're like i, I hit him i didn't even know it's bad or whatever i don't know it's kind of freaks me on you know on one hand i'm like that's pretty cool they're fighting let them be boys. On the other hand, I'm like, God, they're fighting and they don't even know it's bad. Is there a like a guide to parenting? Or I mean, I remember you had baby Ben in the stroller and then Lee, and then all of a sudden the twins. Like, how how at what point do you get comfortable with being a dad and knowing what to do? Or are you still just winging it seven I'm years scared. into this thing? I'm scared every day. I'm scared every day, just kind of hold on for the ride. For me, I'm lucky. I got uh, I'm married to the best woman on earth. Sarah's a Sarah's a beast. Sarah wins every day. So I just kind of follow her lead and just kind of <laughs> hope to survive. But I just try to I just try to make it to to sleep. If I can make it to sleep every night, we good. You're gonna have a lot of high school football games to attend in the next 15 years, Cliff. I hope because you'll have two Ben and Lee will be they'll be on the same team, right? Well, Ben and Ben and Lee are two years apart, so Ben and Lee will play together, and then Lee and the twins will play together. Oh, so Lee's gonna get to play with all of his brothers. <clears throat> yeah. So let me tell you a cool story. I got some friends right down the road, and they got four boys, same age, same age difference as my boys, and with twins, the same thing. 
two years apart, and they got twins two and a half years apart. How did that happen? I don't know. And Holly and Brad got twins too. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the, uh, Jordy and Janelle, they're twin boys. Brooks, Brooks and Bryce, they play football, and they set records for passing. One's a quarterback, one's a receiver, and they set records for passing and receiving and that kind of stuff. So, brother connection, and I hope – my twins play ball like those. Was twins. Sarah athletic? I know she's probably in the kitchen doing breakfast now, so be careful what you say here. But I'm just curious: is there like that? Because I know you were a really good football player. I tried to be a good football player, and uh, Sarah was a volleyball player. Sarah played for the legendary Saint Fusel Sumption High School Mustang volleyball team. Legendary in the state of Louisiana. Like so they've 20, got some athletic genes. What's that? They've got some athletic genes then. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully they kind of athletic. Hopefully they got a little heart and uh, can. Well, play I think athletic. if you're if you're a member of the Crochet family growing up, I mean, we'll get into that in today's show. But I think those kids that the heart drive and and no quit is going to be ingrained into all four of them. <laughs> yeah, let me brag a little bit. So Ben, I don't want to be that dude. Everybody's you know everybody hates to talk to that dude, but I'm gonna tell you just it's a straight fact. Ben started playing football this year for the Baylor Foos Raiders, same program I played for as a kid. The league's like 38 years old. The league's probably over 40 years old, I think. So Ben goes to play D team, five and six year old football. And he, uh, the, the, the start of the season was kind of rough. He gets nervous, wasn't quite sure what was going on. And um, anyway, he pushes through. Starts having fun, becomes a starting quarterback. They went eight and one, won the Super Bowl. He threw like eight touchdown passes. I mean, I'm really not that parent that goes overboard, <laughs> but go Raiders. That's that's uh, my parents were too. Big photos of my hockey stuff all over. That is totally accept. That's totally acceptable and understandable. So. Are, is he? Are they throwing the ball at that age, or is it all option like handoff running stuff? Well, it's like how many complete pass. passes? Like, are there attempted passes during the game? Yeah, he probably throws four or five passes a game. But um, he, play, he plays with some really athletic kids, so they would run like a, a, a tight end pop pass four yards down the field, and a kid would catch it and take it to the house. Stat so pattern. Yeah, just that's a out. fifty. That's a fifty-four yard completion. Correct. Or they would run it. Or they would run it where the wing back would just turn and catch it and house it. So let me tell you, I mean, that's how the story goes. So Ben played with a kid, and his uh, the kid's uncle. The kid's uncle is Kai Prien. But you, you don't know the name right now. You'll hear it in Baton Rouge next year. Uh, Kai Prien signed with LSU to play football. He's like a four-star recruit. Well, Ben was playing with his his little nephew. So, uh, and Duda, Duda and them was, was rocking people. And Steven, it was pretty fun. Go Raiders. So is Ben like a big Joe Burrow fan then, since he's the he's a QB in Louisiana growing up? Or who's Patrick his? Mahomes. He's a Mahomes guy. Patrick Mahomes and Justin Jefferson. Really? Yeah. Just the Mahomes, just because he likes watching them on Sundays. YouTube. Oh. Lee, Lee, who's your favorite football player? Tyreek. Who's oh, your favorite? Tyreek Hill. Lee's a Tyreek Hill fan. Really? Yeah. That's a uh, that's that's a uh, that's small and fast then. <laughs> yeah, I guess it. Uh, he likes the Dolphins. <sighs> I would imagine in Louisiana, they're not giving out participation trophies to every single team like they are at other parts of the country. Like, I think you got you to gotta earn it, right, if you win the Super yeah. Bowl down there. I mean, there are winners and losers in in Pierre Park football land. Well, yeah, we try to, we try to keep it uh, traditional with winners and losers. Try not to give out participation trophies. Got to keep them involved, but, yeah, you got to work for the trophies. Yeah. What's the toughest part about being a dad? The toughest part about me being a Danny? Yeah, yeah. We'll stick with the sports thing is being quiet. You know, because I'm I'm like, uh, you know, I like to coach football, junior high football and stuff. But before the season started, I, I made a deal with myself that I wouldn't I wouldn't coach Ben. I wouldn't tell Ben nothing. 
So I sent him on a field for practice in the game. And I just uh I just I just be quiet. The only thing I tell him is uh three things. You gotta do three things. Have fun, hustle, and listen to your coach. And that's the only thing I tell him. I don't I don't I don't tell him nothing about stance. I try not to tell him nothing about nothing. I just I just watch. Have you had all four of them in the blazer yet at the same time? I have. What is that like? Um <laughs> Had all four in a boat before. Yeah, it's it's, it's pretty. Uh, it gets kind of crowded, and the, because the little ones, what happens? The big ones get up on a deck, and they start swinging rods like crazy, and then the little ones stay in the bottom of the boat, eating snacks, climbing on Sarah, touching buttons, and it's um. What I tell you, what I have learned is you just you got to go with the flow. Don't try to. Don't try to stop it. Just go with the flow. And no matter what, like whether you're fishing or just playing, you, you just, yeah, don't make, too, Sarah, you want to come do it? Sarah's coming on the interview with me. Uh, Sarah, Sarah could hop on the interview. Sarah, are you coming? No, not today. No, nah, she says not today. But yeah, like, like you, you just, you go fishing or if, like prime example, we like to go to basketball games, right? Go to basketball game, go to concession stand, get $20 worth of snacks, sit them on the bench. And as long as they're not cursing at nobody or pulling nobody's hair, we're good. I told Matt Lee, I said, things must be going good at the crochet household because the last three times I've talked to, to Cliff, no one's been bitten. <laughs> it's getting uh, it, it's getting better. Nobody got bit. Oh, yeah. There, there, was a, there, was a small, there was a small period of time there where that seemed to be the go-to move. Yeah, that was uh, – <laughs> that's like the two-year-old move. Yeah. That's, that's, like, that's like a year and a half in a two-year-old move where they start biting people. That's the first weapon they learn about. I guess that's fair. I found some gold on the internet. So this is a 2010 Bassmaster article. It's updated as of 2015, I think, 2016, because you had just made your third classic. But it's 20 questions with Cliff Crochet. This was well, an old – I remember doing that interview. Th this was old. But I was wondering if I could ask some of those same questions, see if you remember what you said there and if that's changed. Yeah, go ahead. First of all, look, I'm, I can share the screen here. This is this is kind of cool. There you are with your lovely bride. That's that's Sarah pre pre children, right? That's in a classic that? bank. Uh, what year is that? It would have had to been right after you'd made your third classic. So Pregnant 15, 16. So that's like February and March. Ben was born in September. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so that was right before the craziness has started. Yeah. Yeah, we were clueless. Clueless. Yeah, totally clueless. <laughs> totally clueless. Uh, let let me let's ask some of these uh some of these questions here. Uh, first of all, like you literally were a Cajun baby. Where did that nickname actually come from? I don't think I've ever asked you that because I'm just gonna share some of these. There you are as the Cajun. How about baby. that? How about that? That uh, Cajun baby comes from uh, Palaka, Florida. 2009, Southern Open. Uh, fish the St. John's River. That was the first tournament I got a check in. I fished Opens in 07, 08. No, I was in 08. I was in 08. Uh, let me see. That was 08, 2008. 70809 fish opens. 08. I'm in Palatka. I get a check, finish like 24. So I'm feeling like a million dollars pumped up. I'm about to make the classic, you know. Yep. I mean, I was miles and miles and miles from where I wanted to be. But anyway, I get a check. I'm feeling good. Life is good. And uh I I go get a hamburger down at, at the at the way in. And I asked the woman, I told her I wanted a hamburger and uh, French fries and a coat. And she said, "You, where you from? You must be from Louisiana. I'm like, how you figure that out? You know, I guess I talk funny. I get it. So that was that was part of it. And then during that way in, they talked about Big Show was there. And they talked about the Elite Series superstars, and KVD and Ike and Ish and all these, all these nicknames and call signs. So no big deal. So I'm getting on the road, going home. And I'm. I got a check for $2,500. All excited. Got a check. I'm about to hit the big time. And I'm like, man, I'm going a, I'm to a, uh, come up with a name like those dudes got. 
that way when I make it, I, I'll be uh, you know, I got something to yeah, yeah. call sign. So my guy started so I started going with different stuff, thinking, thinking, thinking. And then a uh, Cajun baby fishing was born. Oh, and you came like, up with the nickname yourself. Yeah, driving home from Palaka, somewhere between Tallahassee and Baton Rouge, I guess. So I so I come up with it. Now you have to implement it. Well, I can't use it yet because I'm fishing opens and it's not quite time. It's just not. So I tell two or three of my buddies about it. I was running with Jamie last at the time. And Pittman, I, I tell them about it and they think it's, you know, stupid. I'm, I'm, I'm an idiot, whatever. So fast forward to 2009, I qualified, fish a 2010 Classic and Elite Series. I'm getting my boat wrap and you got to put your name on the side of the boat. And uh, I was rigging my boat at Ken Sherman, front to back boat service. Ken took care of me for a long time. Uh, but anyway, Ken says, man, you ought to put that on the side of the boat. Cajun baby, Cliff Crochet. I'm like, you think? He's like, bro, I'm telling you, you need to do it. So I go to the rap shop, get the stick of made on my, you know, Cajun baby, Cliff Crochet. And uh, Hank, Hank was on the water taking pictures uh, for – during practice for the classic, gotten a couple pictures. Keith Allen was the MC at the time. He got a hold of it. Got it to the arena. They call me Cajun Baby Cliff Crochet. And it stuck. Smartest, stupidest thing I ever come up with in my life. Why is it the stupidest? Well, it was it was uh it started as a joke, you know what I mean? Yeah. Clowning. Most of the time when you're clowning, it ends up not good or you end up in trouble or you know. But this ended up being a good deal, and it worked. Stuck, and it, you know, I didn't, I didn't make a million dollars off of it. I'm still trying to make a million off of it, but, but it definitely helped me stand out in the crowd. I think I have a Cajun baby shirt still. I mean, you had shirts made and all yeah, sorts of I had stuff. Some, I had some made back in the day, some originals, hats. I had, I did a little bit, trying to just keep the, keep it moving. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm going through these 20, uh, 20 questions here. And you, you mentioned how everything kind of started kicking off there and you fish the Opens in 07, 08, 09, that deal, and then the Elite Series. But something that's going on right now is is uh, I, I kind of think the, the Bass Nation, which is the old Federation Nation, which a lot of us kind of grew up in that are in that age, and then they had the split, and it got wild between the TBF and the Bass Nation. But I think right now Bass is kind of figuring out what to do with the Bass Nation to try to get – uh, more participation to keep the heritage, their tradition, the the Brandon Polinick, Brian Kirchel, Iconell. I mean, there's a bunch of guys. Uh, Caleb Jamie, Sumrall, Jamie Lash, yeah, it, Wagley, Caleb uh -huh. Sumrall. It's insane the names there. But here's the thing: it's really small, and if you know about it, you know about it, and if you don't, you don't know anything about it. So it'll be interesting to see what Bass does. But but I'm interested in your take on it because well, here I'll, I'll add this. Second. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tim Carmus, Louisiana Federation guy, made the Nationals this year. That Isn't was, Dave Cavell, Louisiana, too? Dave Cavell, Jason Pittman. Uh, uh, who's the dude who won absolutely everything out of the back of the boat? He didn't fish. Ryan Levine. Ryan Levine won when they had a co-angler deal. He's a boater. He qualified for Louisiana like in the bottom half. So he went as a co-angler. He went to the national championship, towed his boat, drew a Japanese guy who didn't speak English. The guy hadn't caught a fish in three days. Levine's like, I'm going to smash him. The guy through his interpreter says, hey, this guy's from Louisiana. He's going to catch him. The Japanese guy goes, okay, let's roll. <laughs> Levine blows everyone away by 20 pounds, gets to fish the final day as a boater, wins the co-angler side, a boat, and like $20,000 cash, also wins the boater side, another boat, another $20,000 cash, and a spot in the classic, sold both boats, went back to work. Yeah. Fish a classic at Conroe. So the cool thing about that whole federation thing, you're talking about keeping it going and getting on. Yeah, I mean that's important to you. That's that's how you kind of yeah. got that's that's your first hardware, dude. Yeah, but like me, Jamie, Ryan, Tim, Pittman, uh Jamie, that, that whole crew, Cavell, dude, that was all like uh same era, same like we all came up together generally, you know, in like a five year period. And and them dudes, we all made the classic. It's, I mean, it's, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, you still talk to all those guys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
But that, that picture you got right there is uh, totally awesome. I love it. That's back in the day. That's 2006. Look, you got the Falcon patch sewn on. Yeah, that's March 2006. No, uh, that's uh, wow. That was at that point. So on that team was um, go back in time a little bit. You're talking about Cole Garrett and James Kennedy, who had both made the classic through the Federation. Okay, that's how I know the James Kennedy name. And James fished the elites for a couple of years. Yep. So those dudes were on that team. So at, at that point in Louisiana, fishing that time, that was uh, I mean that was Van Dam and Iconelli and and Skeet and that those dudes were on that level in the Federation. That's how we viewed them. Yeah. And I I beat you know I, I beat those guys and won that angle of the year in Louisiana Federation and it was. And that was a side. That was the best, bro. So to win at that point, in, to win Angler in the Federation was like nothing else mattered. I could have quit fishing at that time, and, and it was, was awesome. Like, it were was, you in high school though? No, I was. Uh, I was 20, 22, 20, Okay, twenty two. That that tournament right there was was. Uh, I was at an interesting time, uh, personally. I needed I needed that win big time, man. That was that was big. You think you're here if you don't win that federation tournament? Yeah, I think so. You think you still make yeah. it just different path? Well, I, I, that gave me a touch of success. But so here, here, this is a personal story. Side note, you ready? <clears throat> so that was March. That was March of uh, 06, right? September of 05. I worked search and rescue Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, which oh, was wow. which was a lot. And then March of uh, 06, uh, my buddy, I watched my buddy get killed at work. So September was a big deal. Early March was a, a very big deal. And then three weeks later, I, I win that I win that Angle of the Year title, and it kind of it kind of gave me a little bit of peace moving moving forward something positive happening something positive something to uh get back on track and and uh so yeah so that that deal was a big deal like personally but I, yeah do i think i'm still here even without that yeah i think so i i mean it's pretty well documented that you were in law enforcement from the time you were what 18 19 18 yeah 18 um but I didn't know that you had done search and rescue for Katrina. Yeah, it did like we did like seven days through with the sheriff's office, and uh, I didn't. I mean, I didn't see nothing like. I mean, it was. Dude, yeah, it was pretty intense. When you see a city flooded, and people sitting on rooftops, and uh, I mean, when you pick up cops from a building, and you're like, "What's up? Wait, what? What's the deal?" And they're like, "I don't. We don't know. I'm just." Bring us to dry land, or you drop people off on the on the highway and there's nothing there. Dude, I, I went to uh, we were we went pick up some people. We had a bus on the interstate, and then there was an overpass. They was coming over overpass and they had a ladder to climb down. And I was sitting, I was on the uh, interstate doing a deal. Look at baby Ben. What's up, Ben? Congrats on a great football season. Saw your picture eight and one quarterback spinning it. Champions. Your dad was bragging that? on you. Go Raiders. <laughs> but we was uh we was doing that deal on the interstate and uh dude they had like eight helicopters. I could see it one time. They had like two on the ground, had two staging over there, and they had one over there. And I'm like, oh my god, this is intense. No, it was Matt. it was um no, it was something to see. Wow. And you were just, were you like in an aluminum boat or was it one of those inflatable rafts? Yeah, it was in like bay boats and stuff. Uh, like full on boat. boats. Yeah, like boats, like running down the highway. Wow, that's something that'll stick with you. Yeah, and on uh, on uh, Interstate 610, when you come down 10, you jump on 610, coming through Baton Rouge as a Louisiana dental school. And that's where we was, we was picking up NOPD from. It was pretty cool. <laughs> we uh, commandeered a van from some people. The dude I used to work with, Michael Brown, his mom and daddy was in New Orleans. 
So we had to try to get to their house to see where they was at and stuff. It was. How do you commandeer a van? Is it like in Grand Theft Auto where you literally just open the door and you're like, get out of the van? Like, hey, sheriff's office, we need you, we need this van. And they're like, yeah, whatever you guys need? Like, yeah, kind of well. I mean, they really didn't have a choice, probably. N- not really. It was, but it was, I, like, who, who, I mean, how does that happen? Like, it, dude, does that get returned to them at the end? Yeah, we went where we had to go and then we <laughs> brought it back to them. It was. Did you at least fill up the gas tank? Can't fill up the gas tank. There is no gas. Oh yeah, you're in a natural disaster. Yeah, it was a uh, that was an interesting deal. Is there a different Cliff Crochet? I mean, you are known for life is good, positive energy, fun loving. But you know, during the law enforcement time and that, I mean, do, is there a different kind of level that you engage, or, or do you approach it all kind of with the positive? At you, you know what I mean though. Like, yeah, there, you are. Uh... So some, I mean, sometimes things, you know, sometimes things get uh professional, you know what I mean? Uh, but uh, for the most part, the life is good. Sarah's, Sarah's one comment away from being on the show, whether she likes yeah. it or not. I'm, yeah. I'm going to make her come yeah. in here. You have to scoot the seat over. Yeah, she's coming. She, she has one more comment. I'm going to turn it over to her. <laughs> but, uh. But the uh, life is good, good attitude, what's up, you know, like he's a good dude. That whole mentality, just being easy, helped me a whole bunch in law enforcement. Because cause <clears throat> I'm going to win no matter what. I'm going to get what I want no matter what. You know what I'm saying? Like if you if you go on to jail or you're getting a ticket, like that's fact. That's going to happen. And it may take an extra three or four minutes, but if I can, if I can approach you and, and – uh, explain to you what's about to happen and maybe let you feel like you in control for a minute. You know, 99% of the time it, it went down a lot, a lot more graceful than, than if you, if you went there, uh, smash and grab, you know, mm-hmm. now, it, I mean, sometimes you got to smash and grab and that's just the nature of the beast, but I like to take two or three extra minutes and just talk through it and life is good. And, it all it all ends up the same anyway. Yeah. I'm gonna win eventually. The cop is gonna win eventually. Yeah. So let's just, you know, we'll do it the easy way and life is good. Are you start you basically retired in twenty thirteen or yeah, the fishing thing? Away. And then have you gone back a little bit or I roll I went riding around a couple of times and check it out, but uh I don't I don't mess with it now. Yeah. It's been like a decade. Does it feel like a lifetime ago? No, it feels like two weeks ago. Really? Yeah. Life moves fast. I think Ferris Bueller said that. Life life moves fast. Uh, you know what? I've never seen that movie. Are you serious? Yeah, no, never seen it. You need to go check that out. The Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yeah, like I know the quotes from it, but I've I don't know the context. Like I I you're not living right, bro. Your I think he doesn't cool. he steal his dad's car and skip school. Isn't that the premise of the movie? He leave, he steals his buddy's daddy's car. Oh, even worse. It's pretty awesome. Uh, here's one of the questions here. I'm curious if this has changed your answer. Uh, the question was, what is the best advice you've received in your career and the hardest lesson you've learned? You know what you said? No. You said, my daddy taught me about how important it is to hustle, give 100%, set goals, and stay focused. Fact. 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 The, the heart is still, still, you still stay, stand by that. He, Ten years after that original interview. Yeah. Yeah. The hardest lesson. What do you think you said there? Probably the business side of. It. No, you said it's easy to make excuses when things are tough, and it's easy to keep going when things are going well. But you need to push forward when things are challenging, and that's a difficult lesson to learn. You just got to keep your chin down and make the next cast. That's true. Yeah, just keep grinding. That's true. I would, yeah. That, then this is a real important question. How important is a manly beard? I've learned to, I've learned to understand the power of a beard is tremendous. It's great. Except when you put the wrong guard on it. And it, it almost you almost shave it off. 
<laughs> you have. I think I could. I don't. I, you said I'm a grown man, and when I do grow it out, my beard makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> It does. I've been having it for I've been having it for a while now. For the most part, I like it. All right. Uh, what did you think back then? Your your greatest weakness as a professional angler was offshore. What do you, What is your greatest weakness as a professional angler now? Offshore. All right. That's still the same. Uh, what do you think? This is an interesting one. So I'll remind you, this is an original 2010 interview updated after you'd made three classics. So you've got some mixed answers in here. What do you think we could improve on as a sport? Sure, I don't know. You said, I think tournament fishing gets pushed too much. I love tournament fishing. And I know a lot of anglers do, but it overshadows the guys who just like to be on the water. There's nothing wrong with that approach. I think is the answer we could work harder to promote that guy in his style because that's where we all came from. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I, I still agree with that because – and check this out. And we've had this conversation before, me and you. So now high school fishing is a big deal. Yep. And we push some people, you know – and I, I think that's great. High school fishing is a big deal. I know it saves kids and it gives kids an opportunity to compete in tournaments. And we we, we push in our sport. I get it. I love it. But we got to make sure that we send the right message that it's, it's cool just to be a fisherman. Cat fisherman, bass fisherman, Sunday fisherman, just be a fisherman. I I really agree with that. Yeah, I still I still believe that. That's good stuff. All right, we're going to take our first break of the show. When we come back, we're going to dive into uh, we're going to dive into that tournament side. I got some some of Cliff's stats. Uh, I want to want to talk about uh, a little bit of the past and what he has learned going forward into the 2023 season. It's it's Cliff and QB one. QB one. Ben, you want to hit that gritty fun? Ben's a gritty That's, fan. That's your go-to move, huh? The gritting. Yeah, we got a gritty on the first touchdown, and uh, I wasn't – we got to work on – I wasn't excited about the gritty too much. But I watched this the little documentary story on how that came about. It's like an NFL player's friend yep. who started it, and then he did it, and then it took off. Yep. Justin Jefferson's buddy did it, and then it blew up. Well, yeah, of course you know that. That's got some LSU connections. Jamar Chase did it. Yeah, Jamar Chase did it too. They all did it. Has Mahomes done it yet? <laughs> Tyreek Hill did it. Yeah, he Tyreek Hill. Did the gritty. Yeah, actually, once he did it in the locker room. Yeah. yeah. Does Lee know the gritty too? No, not No, you're still working on it. What do you got on your head? An elf, elf hat. Oh wow! There's a. Which one's that? My name's Chippy. No. Wow, you've got a lot going on. All right, BTL on a Wednesday. We'll be back with the starting lineup of the Crochet family right after this. Introducing HDS Pro. Watch fish reacting to your lure live with Active Target 2. Get game changing clarity in the megahertz range with the new Active Imaging HD Sonar. Find the richest fishing spots with CMAPS charts. Take full control of your boat with the ultimate fishing system, HDS Pro. The more you see, the more you catch. The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up. With the angler, design, function, and performance in mind, nothing on this new offering was compromised and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry leading design coupled with tournament winning performance. The Puma STS from Basscat. Feel the rush.
Hey guys, Gerald Swindle representing the AFCO Hydronaut. This is the jacket I love wearing when times is tough. And I'm talking about the weather, not the fishing. The jacket, what I like, I got a double cup right here. I can seal up the bottom of my jacket because when you're fishing, you're holding your arms up. You're bad about getting water runs downhill. Everything bends good. I'm long arm. Look, it fits very comfortable. My arms are flexible. I've got the speed hood on, pouring down rain. I can get everything zipped up. One thing they did is they made plenty of pocket space. If you ain't got enough pockets in a Hydronaut rain suit, you just got too much stuff from the water membrane. Brain. That's 30K, baby. 30 times the reason you ain't gonna get wet. Super warm. If it's cold in the wintertime, you put on your Hydronaut, you're gonna be a much more comfortable person. If you wanna just look sexy at Dairy Queen, where you hide or not? We got it from small to 5X. Most rain gear does not come in that many sizes. You got waist adjusting straps. We can make it fit you. No matter what the environment is, we want you to be comfortable. We want you to be dry. You gotta check it out. It ain't gonna let you down. The KVD 100 Jerkbait. 15 different colors. A perfect combination of roll, wiggle, and flash. Increased castability. 3D eyes. Premium black nickel hooks. KVD. Tie one on. Striking lures. All right, welcome back. VTL on a Wednesday with the Cajun baby Cliff Crochet. Just did a hat change as we came back. That was, that was, that was solid there. Uh, that last commercial there reminded me, and I'd forgotten about this, that's that Mark Jeffrey's voice talking about the one and only KVD jerkbait. Uh, you were a fan of Jeffrey's and what he was doing with the Bass Zone website way back in the day. Like before I was around like 05, 06, 07, an early adopter of the BZ and all things professional fishing that Mark was doing, right? Yeah, I got a, uh, I still got that hat, the original hat I had somewhere. And I had a shirt. I had a uh, Baz on shirt. And I, I, I'm i not sure how I found Baz on. Maybe through uh, Alan Kelly, buddy of mine that lives, used to live in Wagner. I don't know. I don't know how I found Baz on, but I thought it was awesome. I thought the one thing I loved about Baz on back in the day, I, I love the articles every day. I love the chat room. I used to watch the chat room. <laughs> Dude, the chat room was used to be wild. There were like death threats and parking lot things that were parking lot fights that were set up and accusations. And then there'd be fishing report. Like when I first came on, like Jeffrey's biggest deal was how not to get sued over the chat room, how to monetize it, and how to manage it. Like his, it was like a full time job for him in there. I mean, it was just, brrr, it was just a steady stream. Do they still make, is it, uh, was it Black Angel Jigs? They still making them? That was a big one way back in the day. I have no idea. I remember that was right when I started interning. Whatever went down. What about there was... a and Bates? Yeah, yeah, they're still around. a and Bates. And then there was a rap company that did everybody's rap. Yeah. Yeah, and that was Hootie? all mess message board fodder. What about Hootie? Hootie was a, a big character. Yep, he was on a big one board? on the message board. I think that's how Mark found a bunch of people to... Uh, like write for them and cover stuff too. It's just on the message board. And then Bradley had a um, at one point ran a bass zone rap. He did. So that was a deal where it was a vintage Jeffries thing. Brad made the Elite Series, didn't have any sponsors, didn't have any raps. So Jeffries was this is the craziest thing ever. So Jeffries was sponsored by Skeeter. So instead of even Jeffrey's paying for it, I think if my memory serves me right, he was even able to run the Bass Zone rap like through the Skeeter sponsorship. So Hallman gets a free rap, and Jeffrey's gets a BZ rap that Skeeter had to pay for. <laughs> Jeffrey's is something else. He is something Apple else. Lane, Here, look at these. This will hold on one second. This will bring back some some uh, some memories. So these are the vintage. This is the timeline of the vintage uh, Bass Zone hats. Because like I said, we're working. I was working on vintage. So this was the first one. The purple with the yellow Z Smith Action Optics. Yellow underbill. Not ideal for sight fishing. No. And then. Oh, Vikings. Yes. And then he said, you know what? Let's switch it up. Fitted. Bass zone on the back, yellow, purple. I had a black one. 
So this is the everyone talks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think the yeah, that's up there. I'll get that one. So then on the back, I think. Then then he combined the two. So then you have the baseball style with the yellow Z, the purple bill, and that's when he came up with the net effect on bass fishing. It's almost like an LSU hat right there. It kind of looks LSU-ish. Now, I'm I'm assuming this one might be the one that you have. I still got that hat. Mm -hmm. uh, this would have been like 07, I want to say. Yeah, see if you can find it. It might be in the bag. Is it that one right there? Yeah. Yeah, that's the the silver. Then it then we're completely gone with the thank goodness. We're completely gone with the purple and yellow. Uh not that there's anything wrong with that. I just meant for the fishing <laughs> website. I like but, but don't send hate mail if you're an LSU fan or a Vikings fan. Uh but then that was when the 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 tagline changed to it's all about being there. Yes. So it went from the net effect on bass fishing yeah. to it's all about being there. And then there was this weird period where Jeffries got obsessed with lions about six or seven, probably seven or eight years ago. Do you remember that? No. So now we're transferring from bass zone to BTL. And so our first BTL hat, and there's not very many of these in existence. So it says BTL there. This was back in the Nike days. So it had to be a Nike hat, which this is not a Nike hat. That's literally the Nike logo that he had put on that hat. Not, not joking. And then, you know, this is the BTL, the official BTL hat. All it is is a lime lion. That's a Detroit lion. It's basically the Detroit lion in purple or in, in green. Anyway, that's the – and now we've got just the standard. I don't have any. I, there's one out in the truck, just the Richardson 112 BTL hats. I don't know how, how did, we got how on did, that was that hat. I remember how that did hat. A, How did a Richardson 112 become relevant? Like, like at could, one point, nobody knew what a, what hat they wore. And then about three years ago, everybody had to wear a Richardson 112. I think it was the uh, – that red dirt kind of Texas, Oklahoma uh, scene, wasn't it? Like Richardson the Cowboys and stuff? I was just, it's a good hat. There's another one out there that I can't remember what the name of it is. Uh, a who, who, not a who daddy. That's a Jean LaRue soft plastic. Thing, but it, it's not a hooey. It's a uh, you, you pong, you, you pong. It fits amazing. Oh, did you find the hat? That's it. Look at the sweat on that. <laughs> How long has it been since you had that one on? It's been a minute. Let the, it's all oh, my up. gosh, Cliff. Is that the hat you qualify for the elites in? Uh, One of them? I got a, um, I think, yeah, I'd have to look back. I, I had on a, um, I had them red ski hats on. Okay. When I qualify, but there is a picture of me digging in a rod box at Rayburn, 2009 Central Open. I might have a bass on hat on. I don't know. Very nice. Hey, uh, what are your thoughts on forward facing sonar? Have you gotten uh, into that? I mean, you just made an Instagram post. This is how I know you're either evolving or lying. One of the two. Those are the only two options. Because you made a post where you're like, hey, really looking forward to this sinking jerk bait. And I was like, A, it, that would require open water unless you're flipping it around Cypress. And then it sinks and it does it. Or B, you've expanded your, your repertoire a little bit. I'm trying to uh, stay true to my roots. But you got you to gotta look at stuff. You got to check it out. You got to... You gotta, um, like I like I'm not gonna try to to redo whatever and 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 like change how I fish, but I got enough sense to know that I gotta peek at it a little bit. So I try to learn it in case I get a chance to use it. Um uh, see, so yeah, I mean I I'm I'm kinda I'm not, you know, going crazy and, and spending days on the water learning it, but I I do try to take Why some not? time. It um uh, because one I've spent Years and years and years doing one thing, 
Right. Got a lot invested in, in how I like to fish, and I've had some success doing it. Um, it's going to take more time. It's going to take a lot of time to learn it, and I do want to look into it. You know what I mean? But the more and more people that go out and look for these fish, they come, they, they're getting off the bank. So the bank is opening up a little bit. So, I, you know, I hope everybody gets a forward face and so on. Two of them and get off the bank and y'all go look for fish in the middle. All right. No secret. And I think you'd be first to admit, not the not the years that you've wanted mm-hmm. over the last five or six years. Fact. Lower half AOY finishes. I mean, you've had a couple top tens. You've had some some highlights sprinkled in there. But as a whole, I mean, we're not talking that 2000. 12, 13, 14, where you went back to back classics and had top 10 finish in the Bassmaster Angler of the Year and were ahead of the guys that you grew up idolizing. Is that a format change? Is that a life change? A family change? What What is, because no. I mean, you obviously have the talent in you. You've, you've won opens, you finish in the top 10, you fished in four Bassmaster classics, you have over a half million dollars in earnings. You've been doing this over a dozen years now. Yeah, so. Um, so yeah, the last couple of years haven't been good. So the format, so let us, we'll go back to way back, way back when, so get, get started, have some success, you get going. And, uh, so you like fight for every, like you fight to catch them. Once you catch them, this is what gets me in trouble in the water. I see something or I feel something. I know the work. And instead of being normal and going to catch fish and you like you know following your gut to see what you got and just and and just go with that, I'm like, all right, that works. Like I bet I can go catch them over there on a the spinner bean. But let me add to it. Let me go find a, the needle in the haystack. Let me go find the diamond in the rough. Let me let me do something special. Let me find something different. And that and that kills me. And then I I'm like, man, I you go back and you and you and you throw it spinner bait down in Windy Bank and you catch two. And had you done that for six hours, you'd have caught 14 fish, you know, with, with some big ones and life is good. But when you go when you go when you go throw a frog or a jerk bait or you go do something different that that don't really work for six hours, and you come back and you do what should work for an hour, you, that's the results you get. Like I gotta I always want to find something more, something mm-hmm. Something more difficult. I don't, it's, it's, it's stupid, yeah. but because since the since the BPT, and I had to do a lot of looking up to find this. Average everything out. Fifty sixth place average finish in those events. So you're, I mean, I guess for the last four years it was just you weren't catching enough. Fifty sixth is you're catching fish. You've got some quality. You had some tanks, you had some good ones, but as a whole, you have an em- enormous, like in 2021, you had consecutive, your entire 2021 season was 7th, 54th, 58th, 59th, 56th, 45th, 54th. That's like maddening because you're right there. Yeah, that, uh, so what, now that was kind of, that was, some of that was the different format where you had to catch more fish. Yeah. Um, uh, so and this is not going into the format and that whole conversation or whatever, but like fact, that format, every fish counts, you have to catch more fish. Yeah, that's not your style. And what happened to me a lot of times is I would have a I would have a fair day. I would catch seven, nine, ten fish, and but I just needed a few more. Or if you get ten bites a day, you miss one, you set the hook early on two, now you're down to seven fish, and it just I just didn't get quite enough bites, and that's just that's just not not being good enough on the water, you know, not not yeah. not closing it out. I mean, so in theory, you're back to the five fish, and there's fewer than ever guys on the bank. Life is good. When did you start saying that? Life is good. Yeah, I mean, I know it's been like a, a t-shirt brand for a while, but that's something that I feel like you've picked up over the past decade. Life, life is good. Started. When I was fishing bass and uh, on the elite series somewhere, and he, he had a tough day on the water, and I wanted to, you know, my emotions were starting to come out. I wanted to about to pop off because I had a frustrating day on the water and things wasn't going right. I needed a, I needed a, 
I needed an exit. I need I needed something just to I could relieve some steam and just just get off a of stage without saying nothing stupid. Life is good. Life is life is good. Can go anywhere from, you know, a kindergarten conversation all the way to, I'm really dropping f bombs and wanting to fight with you, but you will never know. It just covers anything. Life is good, bro. Just life is good. Just keep moving. Covers anything. Do you remember the conversation you had with Chip Porsche? We were up north around Cayuga, and he was having a tough year in 2013. And you were, uh, you were actually having your best year at that point. We were in a, we were in a seafood restaurant. Do you remember that at all? Yeah, I remember. It's kind of stuck with me. Yeah, generally, generally, if I remember the conversation, Chip was talking about uh, he was struggling and 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 money and how it didn't work or whatever. And, and I, I think I basically told him just, just go fishing, keep moving, don't worry about nothing, like. Don't don't worry about why not. Just just go and let it let it happen. That was a part of it, but you also talked about about you don't understand. Let me see if I can get this right. You don't understand how bad you want it until your back is up against the wall, and then you understand what it takes to fish at that level because you don't have an option. You remember yeah. that? Are you quit? Yeah. Yeah. Like if you want to keep doing it, you you have to make that decision. Either it's it's not going to work out, or you you have put yourself in that position where you have to catch them. There is no oh, we'll get them next one. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, like that's true with anything, bro. When when shit gets tough, you gotta if you really want whatever you're doing, you gotta buckle down and and do what you gotta do to be successful. And if if it's not that important to you, you quit and walk away. Yeah. Hey, before before Ben moves on to bigger and better things, I did want to share this because this was in there. It also has the Cajun baby and the logo and everything that was there. Holy cow. You know who that is? Who's that doing? That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, this 20 questions with Cliff Crochet is is whoever did this. This is like a great. Look what back. the heck? What's the story behind this one? That was at, uh, I think that's at Sabine. Those are some crocheted uh, rainbow shorts. Mike, Mike, Michael Malone gave me that. Oh, because they're crocheted. Yeah. I see. That's very interesting. Uh, sponsorship wise, like I said, you haven't. I mean, you haven't been making one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars a year. Like we just had this thing where we were looking at like Michael Neal and. Wheeler and Connell and the money is ridiculous, but it seems like you've had some really good sponsors, uh, Cass King, Bill Lewis, uh, the, the boat companies, that stuff that I mean, are, have really kind of been with you for a number of years. You're always doing stuff on the water for them. Yeah. The, the uh, I've been lucky to partner up with some, some good people throughout my career. Some people I'm, I'm still with some people I'm not, but, um, that I learned early on in 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 my career, it wasn't just about fishing. I didn't really, I didn't really like that fact, but I learned it and I accepted it. And I also learned that you know I probably it's hard for anybody to make enough money just straight fishing to survive. Yeah. So the sponsorship game and the uh, working with people just worked out. I, I think it's fun. Like some people, for me, I enjoy talking to people about boats and fishing and fishing tips and techniques. And I just like hanging out. So really the, the sponsorship deal is fun. Now, sometimes getting sponsors, I don't like selling. I don't, I don't like, it's, it's hard to go to a company and sell what you do and who you are. But once you can get in, and have a relationship with, with the company, with the Al Noreka or Wes Higgins or, or Casey, and, 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 and you get to meet these people, and they get to meet you, and you know you hope that, that they see you having fun. They hope that uh, you hope that you're helping them and helping people catch more fish, and in turn, that sells product. Life is good. That's, that's the fun part of it. 
when you can help somebody have more frontal water and catch more fish and that in turn sells product, that's that's how I like to do it. That's that that's fun for me. What's it what's important for you for the next five to ten years? The ne- now, what's on, on the fishing side. Like are we talking wins? Are we talking consistency, red crests? What what do you what would you like to see fishing wise from your fishing career? Look back on it in five years. Uh, from from this point forward, from five years, look back and what was the goal? I like you better look back and say, hey, you finally got your head out your ass and you went fishing and you became relevant and started pounding in tournaments and, and gotten some got some shootouts and had some fun. Um kind of like we just talk about the conversation with Chip. Here you are, like performance hadn't been what you wanted to be. It's, it's time to, you know, get bet on the water and, and get in a couple fights and get a couple trophies and make some money and life is good. I, I ha- so I mean, it has been, it's got, it has to have been frustrating. It is. It, yeah, because it's not always like, sometimes it's not, it's not what it is on paper mm-hmm. as far as the results, you know what right. I mean? And uh, it's frustrating because you put you put time and emotion and you put, come up with this plan that you think is good. And sometimes it's a really good plan. It just didn't work out, whether it's missed fish or a broken line or fish jumps or whatever. But the plan was good. And the plan was worth a $100,000 first place check. It just didn't work out. And, and you look stupid because you finished 64th. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um but I from five yeah, I just need to grab another gear and, and uh get back after it and, and make good decisions and catch fish. That would be the plan on the water in five years. So look back and say, dude, what happened? You know, you were thirty nine, you grabbed another gear, had a lot going on. Uh, but some kind of way you still got it done on the water. That would be the goal. You how how important is a Red Crest to you? You think you'll ever fish for the classic again? Or Check this you... out. When in five years from now, yeah. If you look back on this interview, you're like, man, what you know, what was the plan in five years from now? To to I don't want to say it, to reinvent myself uh personally, but re like to my stats over those five years from the previous twelve or thirteen, be like, damn, what happened to this dude? That would that's the goal on the water. Figured something out. Yep. And I think I got it. I, well, I know I got it. Yeah. I know I, I know I can catch them. I've done it before. I just need to uh, just need to do it on the water. And and it'll be a fun ride back to the top. It <laughs> seems like there's a lot of South Louisiana guys who are exceptionally talented on the water. On now, the water. Some, on the water. Mm-hmm. And make the Bassmaster Elite Series, make the top levels of fishing. But then it seems like there's a separation there, too. There's some that then struggle, and then others that go on to be, you know, the hackneys, and, and you've been in it for 13 or 14 years. Do you see, you understand what I'm saying there? What do you think that is? It, um, the guys that, like, good fishermen, from South Louisiana, just I guess we're just lucky to be from Louisiana and maybe God let us catch a few fish. You know, it's just a culture thing. I, people enjoy fishing and you live in a swamp, so I guess it kind of all goes together. Um, but the, the like to get there now, the morning's really starting. We got breakfast, we got phone calls, we got people yeah, walking awesome. around. Let's see what's going on right here. Uh, yeah. So, the guys that make it, um, man, the biggest thing is just to have a, uh, just to, to know how to get there. That's the biggest deal. Yeah. And luckily, we've had, like, I had people before me that, that went. So, I know how to get there, you know, through the opens and, and that kind yeah. of stuff. Because when you started, had never thrown, when you made the Elite Series, had never thrown a deep diving plug, true or false? I never caught him on a deep diving plug before. Right. The, the first time you caught him on a plug, I believe Harold Allen was watching you. Gunnersville. Gunnersville was the first time I smashed him. 
in the Elite Series. Yep. I mean, there's a ton of techniques that you did not learn or had not fished until you were in Elite Series competition, true? True. And and really, that might have been the best thing for me. Because I had six tackle boxes, and I only did about three things. And I might go flipped, back. Flipped. Frog. Flip, frog, and crank. Let's or spinner bait. Let's spin a beat. Very simple. Very simple. How many boxes do you carry now? 84,000. Oh, you're a guy who, who loads the boat down now? Yeah, I'm a... Um, Maybe maybe I need this. Maybe I need that. Maybe I need this. I'll, I'll post a picture this year. No more. So in a blazer, we got two boxes. You got a center box, and you got a front a front big box. I'll make it a goal this year just to just to fish out at one center box. Because Dean doesn't. Dean still carries like six box. Now he's great, and he's got some in the truck, and he'll like swap them out. But like him, and I think Casey Ashley's pretty simplistic like that. There's a number of those guys that are just literally you can just take all the boxes out of their boat, and that's the only thing that's in their boat tackle wise. The uh, and I might become that kind of would get me in trouble. <clears throat> you know, go throw a spinner bait right here, man. They might buy the jerk bait over here. They might do this. Mm-hmm. They might do that. If you ain't got it, you can't do it. But then sometimes you feel like you run into the, the deal where you're not you're not trying enough, you're not doing enough to to catch them. Right, Clay's saying you smash him on a Demiki rig in one derby. Mm-mm. No. Well, I did at Cherokee that year. It was the uh, Demiki Derby? Yeah, first time you'd ever thrown it, lead series tournament. Didn't throw it at all. Uh-huh. I caught, caught him cranking up the river, led oh, okay. the first team. And then oh, the front, that's right. And then the front pass through him and um, you know, kept throwing kept throwing a crankbait, kept throwing a crankbait, didn't back down, and ended up finishing like 43rd in that tournament or something. Was Mullins up there with you? Uh, I was there. Thorpe was there. was a couple of us. Chris was up there. Who do you think the best guy's going right now is? We just did the MVP – BTL MVP awards with Brad Hallman, and we kind of narrowed it down. Like if you, if you had to pick the best guys going in the world right now, currently, currently in the world, best going. fisherman in the world, currently, right now, December fourteenth, two thousand and twenty-two. Jacob Wheeler. Okay. Jacob Wheeler, no doubt. Jacob's on another level right now. Brandon, Brandon's really good. Um, do this, uh, but Wheel over the last couple of years has been out of the box. Yeah, he's pretty good. I mean, what you know, top three flippers, power fishing, your style, like top three guys going right now, right now, December 14th, 2022. Hack attack, Thorpe. And um man, I see you see Grumpy a bunch. Grumpy's a good flipper. Grumpy's good. Uh who's grumpy? Who's grumpy? Matt Heron. Oh, okay. You're who's, putting Heron over Christy. Christy Christy Christy's uh Christy's Christy's evolved more. A little more than I don't know. I don't know if he's straight flipping no more. He's kind of a little bit of everything. He went aluminum, kind of opened up a little bit. Uh, forward facing sonar. Now he can do it all. He yes, he is a top three flipper, but he's more of a utility guy now. Okay. Hackney, Tharp, Heron. Yeah, uh, Cliff Crochet. Uh, can you be an effective power fisherman heavy line flipper without having an aggressive personality like can you be a passive yet effective shallow water angler or do you have to have the screw you you're my fish I'm getting you out of the dang bush don't get in my way to be successful at that um, Biff was a flipper too I don't say Biff right. but look at all the personalities that you're naming Aaron Martins is the only one that was a passive a passive flipper. Yeah. Aaron, yeah, Aaron Martins. 
was probably like, because he flipped the drop shot. Yeah. And was talking to cats on the bank and stuff. But he, but he was a different dude too. You know what I mean? No, all the flippers are have a chip on their shoulder. You know, the, you know what's the best thing I like about it? Talking about flippers being like aggressive. If you ever talk to Denny, <clears throat> if you ever had a rough day on the water, or if you ever looking for an attaboy, pat on the back, do not talk to Denny because Denny will crush your heart and just be like, "Name what? me a friendly flipper, Cliff." It, it don't exist. I'm going to the list. I mean, dude, you get a guy out there at the drop shot and stuff, or a ledge guy, and you, you know, you'll be best friends for the next eight hours. You get in a guy's row of bushes who knows what he's doing, and you're like, I might get killed. Uh, is Shama's pretty intense? Yeah, he's yeah, he's got a chip on his shoulder. But there's different levels. You know what I mean? They got like. They got like uh, like ish is like ish Bill Lowen. Bill Lowen. Bill Lowen's a friendly flipper. But that's what it is. This is where we're going right here. Even me to a certain point, like, hey Matt, what's going on here, buddy? Yeah, you know, catching a couple. It's, you know, BTL, life is good. If you come close, I'm gonna kill you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, like uh Bill Lowen to give you a come on, man. Come on. But man. he's also most likely throwing a swim jig. Yeah, but but like silent silent killers, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, okay, Stephen Browning, nice flipper. Yes, Stephen. Unless fits, I, he fits unless in that category. I've got too. him pegged wrong. No, yeah, but Stephen's another one. Like he's gonna act you like Biffle and Browning, just like straight up tell you don't come in here. Biffle, yeah, Denny and Biffle, hack attack. Like look at you, don't come in here. I'm gonna beat you up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Browning, uh, Clay Williamson yeah. says Gary Klein. I feel like he has a fairly foul disposition on the water. Like he would not like you in in his area of flipping. He's I mean, intense. Yeah, very he's in, very and, intense. And he's deaf. And he's, he's deaf. deaf. <laughs> so he could. He just, so, but anyway, yeah, like hey, it's like the old school dudes biffling and them. They like like they just look at you. Don't come in here. Hmm. I'm a, I'm Hallman a, is not a friendly flipper. You do not want to get in the way of Brad Hallman when he's flipping. You do yeah, not want to be Hallman's in his area. Hit. Hallman gets very, very sour when it comes to, you know, if, if he's got three 25-pound strings on his front deck, like he he is psyching. It's like a game. It's like a football game to him. He's psyching himself up. He's like, I'm getting those burr, 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 out of the burr, burr bushes, and there's nothing they can do about it. No one's getting in my way, and I'm going to do it for eight hours. Like he is not a friendly flipper. Hey, the friendly flippers, the Browning, Bill Lowen, uh, Ishama, like they will let you go to a certain point. And you know, like I said, good morning, how you doing? But when you reach that point where you crowd their water, they like they're going to tell you. Like bang. What about Bob? Bobby Lane. Friendly Bobby flipper. Lane kind of plays both that side. Like Bobby's kind of so here's a if Bobby likes you, if Bobby thinks you're a decent guy, he give you a little wiggle room. He'll give you a little wiggle room. If you if if you come in at and and you cry out Bob and he don't like you, he's he's gonna tell you. Like he'll, right. he'll look at you. Someone said, what about Andy Montgomery? That guy's off skipping a chatterbait around docks or doing a shad spawn or a buzz bait or something. He can flip, but I'm, I don't I don't put him in the category of, of cantankerous power fisherman. Andy is a – Andy is a um, – Andy fits in the life is good. Like, Andy laughs. Oh, you know, he plays with his cows and he throws a chatterbait. Andy's a stone-cold killer. I know he is, but he's not a – He I don't put him in the angry Biffle Brower, that type of deal. No, no, he can get no. there quick, but he don't. Okay, live. like Fletcher. So there's a, there's a difference between oh. grass guys and guys who flip everything, right? Like we're talking bushes, lay downs, grass. Like I'm talking about the guys who, if there is something to flip in zero to three foot of water on that lake, they will find it. Yeah. All right. So we've been through that list. We've got so far. I think Stephen Browning leads the way as the friendliest, the friendliest flipper. Yeah, you on, is, uh, you on board with that? Even yeah, though he throws a chatterbait now. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. All right, let's go over to the 
elite ser- uh oh this is a good one john cox john cox is the friendliest flipper of all time yeah Dude, the guy's always like he's like the santa claus of flippers he's just up there catching biggins and having a good time you ever seen john cox get sideways with someone up in two or three foot of water and that's where he no. lives no um I don't think John Cox is utility guy too. No, John Cox is up shallow, man. If there's something to flip, co- up shallow and flipping, but he's also a, a wacky one. I'm doing. Yeah, he, he's um, he's not a straight power no, fishing. Yeah, though. okay. I'd still put him in that category, though. I think he fits in that category. He's on the kind of the fringe of it, but I still think he fits. He is a very, very. He might be the most highest ranking utility shallow water guy. Yeah, uh, Drew Cook, he, I think he can get pretty foul. I'm not saying this is a bad. I'm just saying, like, guys, you... Fishing-wise. More often than not, if they're planning on big string and shallow, they're going to wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Yeah. Brian New, I think, gets pretty... I mean, some of these guys you don't know really well. I think he... He's... Friend, friends are friends that I've hung out with from time to time, but I don't really... Yeah, he's he's very good, but he's, he's way too versatile to be considered just a shallow guy. Uh... Let's see, yeah, Hackney, obviously, no. Christy, yeah, I don't want to mess with Peroznik up shallow. I know he fishes no. everything, but he can be. He's the guy who, when he's up shallow, he's the best shallow. When he's out finessing, he's good at finessing. And if he grabs you, you're in trouble. Yeah, big bear paw. Whoa. Yeah. Schmidt, not a pleasant guy. I don't think, I don't think I'd l- like to fish around Schmidt up shallow. Come on, man. <laughs> Never on. Uh, I was headed right for that lay down. Never on. Uh, never fished around him. Uh, Pat Schlapper. He, uh, dude, I have I've had some interactions with the with Schlapper. He seems like a nice guy, but I think he also does a bunch of different stuff. I think he cranks. He goes off offshore. Uh, Caleb Summerall wouldn't want to mess around with him up shallow. Like he, he would let you know if he appreciates it or not. Yeah, he probably he's probably between a, a biffle and a brownie. If it's going good, if it's going good, he'll tolerate you. If it's not going good, you're gonna feel the the Cajun's gonna oh, come wow. out in him. Yeah. I'm going through the list here. Boy, yeah, it's. I think it's gonna it's gonna be a Stephen Browning win for the friendliest flipper. Stephen or Bill? Wait, we have wait, we have three people. We have Stephen Browning, Bill Lowen. And John Cox, is it? Do we agree on this, Cliff? Yeah, I'm. A, I'm gonna go with Stevens, the, the friendliest flipper. Stephen Browning is the, the friendliest flipper going right now. I think so. Followed by Bill Lowen. Bill, Bill the Thrill. Dollar Bill. Or the Turtle. That's a guy who's got like six nicknames. Yeah, uh, team screen, screen team. Oh, yeah, because of his wife. Oh, ah, every time he weighed in. Every time. Man, he couldn't fish MLF because she'd have to, like, rent a pontoon boat and then scream as soon as the <laughs> clock ran out. <laughs> At Genghis the end of the pump. end of the third period. Genghis pump. If we left anyone out, let us know. Like, we did the, like I said, we did the show with Holman and... uh we did the MVP, and we were—I think we were too keenly aware not to try to be homers. Andy Morgan. Okay, I—I've I, had very limited interaction with Andy Morgan. Like he's always been super nice to me. I've never heard anyone say anything bad. But does that guy is—I don't know—is there a switch that he flips to where he's super intense, or is he—he seems—I don't know. I don't know about him. You know him better than I do, Cliff. Yeah, where does he fit I think on that one? Andy does a real good job of playing uh, old dumb ball from Tennessee. Uh, you know, he's just flipping on down the bank, you know, whatever. Or uh, this, this is what Andy would do to you. You come in on Andy, you come by Andy, and you think, man, I'm, I'm in a good area because I'm by Andy Morgan. Andy will switch gears and say, hey, you can have it because he got another stretch he's going to right down the lane. That's even better. Make you second guess it. Yes. Is he in the list too? 
or not. I feel like Andy does a lot of spinner bait. Like I'm talking about like the guys who, if it's there, that's what they're doing. That's why Faircloth isn't in this list because Faircloth will win offshore. Faircloth will get on a ledge. Faircloth will show throw a drop shot. Most underrated flipper kind of saying conversation. Fletcher Shryock. Get out of here, Fletcher. I'm telling you, Fletcher's a flipper, bro. I mean, I know he does good in Florida, but. He knows his way around the flipping stick. For sure. For sure. <clears throat> I'm, yeah, I'm going brown. Friendliest flipper. I wasn't planning on going there, but I'll take it. What are we eating for breakfast? It looks like it's green. Cinnamon rolls. C- green Christmas cinnamon rolls. Let me show you the full story. So... You can just do cinnamon rolls or my wife gets up, makes a Christmas tree. It's supposed to be a Christmas tree. It was a Christmas tree. Is that called like pull apart sticky bread or something? She said it's like monkey bread. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You add butter, you take the cinnamon roll, tear it apart, add butter, cinnamon, milk, put it in a, put it in a pan, Christmas tree pan. And there you go. Uh, <clears throat> all right, we'll wrap this up. Someone said Wesley Strader. He can he can get cranky. That gum. <laughs> hey, all right, Cliff, wrap this up, bro. So the hour and seventeen minutes. I feel like we've been doing it for six. Six hours. Six minutes. No, well, I was it gonna might. wrap it up. I was gonna let you get back to business at hand. It's a holiday season. Like I said, you got all the kids around. Sarah's making baked might- goods. Mike told me one time, if, you want, if you're doing a show and it feels like it's gone for 10 hours, it's a horrible show. But if you're doing a show and it, and it feels like you've been doing it for five minutes and, it, and you're an hour into it, it's been a good show. That's good. Hey, uh, I posted on my Instagram last night. You ever burned a blister into the entire length of your finger with a hairdryer trying to get your boat wrap off? If you are a fisherman and you got a wrap boat, you, you have gotten blisters on your hands pulling your wrap off. That's a Fact. that's a real first world problem to have. It happens. But I'm complaining about it. Yeah. The best thing to, the best way to pull your wrap off if you can catch it in, in Louisiana it's 80 degrees. You just let that you let that boat bake in the sun for a couple hours and then you put it off. That's the easiest yeah, well, We don't have uh we don't have that option here. Never Might take it up to, to the uh fiberglass shop up in Tulsa that my buddy uh then my buddy Brock runs Shoreline, Shoreline Boat and RV for all your RV and fiberglass bass boat repairs. <laughs> Tulsa, Kansas City, and Austin. They're coming on board next year. Yeah, I couldn't tell from that. <laughs> that was a freebie. <laughs> that was a freebie. All right, KG Baby. Uh, social media, new sponsors, anything else you want to get in here? Plug anything that people can do to stay in tune with you heading into the new year. Uh, Cliff Crochet on all social media platforms. Uh, of course, shout out to the sponsors Blazer, Bolt, Bill Lewis, Casking Power Poles, the Court of Lithium, Crusher Lures, uh, Busby, Lowrance, K2. Always net bait, uh, snag proof. I'm gonna get somebody somewhere, but um, yeah, social media. I hope, I hope, uh, I invite everybody to follow me. Check it out. It's some, it's some uh, promotional sales stuff, but I, I try to keep it real and uh, help people put a few fish in the boat. So it is. I, I would love for Ben to like take us out with the gritty. Ben, you want a gritty? Just a, just like one or just a. Just to hit it for a couple. I mean, dude, you're all you're the quarterback. You're the center stage. You got to get used to this, man. You got another ten years of this stuff. I don't think we get in the gritty this morning. Okay. Well, I, like I said, I appreciate it. Uh, like Neil said, he said, "Thank you for inviting us into your home and visiting with your family." You Couldn't agree more, Cliff. What's that? I'm sorry. I was trying to get Ben on the show. He don't. He don't want to take part. He's on the yeah. show. It's good. Come see. Come see. Real quick, I'm not trying to be that daddy. Jay, come sing. Oh, you can be a daddy all you want. The twins know what's going on. They don't want it. They don't want no part of it. Here they comes don't. Lee. 
Got to give Lee a shout out. Lee, welcome to Mr. Matt. Bye. Lee, thanks for jumping on the show today. I appreciate it. You did awesome. Holy cow. Where'd you catch those? What are those? Bass. Where'd you catch those? Uh, I don't know. This on the Atchafalaya Basin? The spillway. The giving, spillway. Up, giving up cliff spots now. <laughs> Look at this. Uh, Life is good, bro. I'm not, I mean, I could be on a ranch feeding horses and stuff, but instead, I, you know, a good old domestic life. Well played. Well played. All right. John Conley. Go look up domestic life. John Conley. That's about my life. All right. Lee, Ben, Cliff, Sarah. Yes, sir. Penny. Thank you for, uh, thank you for jumping on BTL Penny. today. You, you forgot Penny. You forgot Aunt Pen. Aunt Pen's here. Aunt oh. Pen walked in. Aunt Penny. Yeah. So and you've got you got the aunt, the four kids, the wife, and the golden doodle. <laughs> Want to go get the golden doodle? Yeah, go get the golden doodle. We always like dogs on BTL. This is a great, great show to end the year on. No, Charlie, go back, Boy, I bet. Oh no, horsey now. That dog has the patience of a saint. Yeah, dog, that dog's going to heaven. <laughs> All right, guys. Cliff, have a good morning. I'll, I'll talk at you later. We'll get into some college football talk. Have a good one. Thanks for having me. All right. See you. All right. That was none other than the Cajun baby, Cliff Crochet. I don't even know what to say after closing the segment out like that. That was some good stuff. All right, we're going to take our final break of the show when we come back. Wrap things up on a Wednesday. On a Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday, December 14th. BTL, we'll be back right after. Vibrating jigs are a great choice for any time of year, and the Kamikaze Swim On is a perfect match for any vibrating jig. Two sizes and a unique tail design gives it a bait fish profile and a great swimming action for realism. There are 17 colors. See them all at BigBiteBaits.com. The Spro Little John crankbait has been around for almost 15 years, and it is one of my go-to crankbaits whenever I need a fish in the boat, so you can never have enough new colors. That's why Spro is coming out with a handful of new colors, including Pearl Shad, which has this bleached out white look, but it's got this pearlescent, really, really pretty. We've got Copper Shad, which looks amazing in the water. It's got that purple flake on the back, really, really pops in the water. And then if you want some real pop, we've got Sparkle Shad, nothing but sparkles all over this thing. And then last but not least, we've got the matte sexy shad just a really different looking color for a crankbait so you want to give them a little different look that matte sexy shad is definitely the one to go with all these colors are available in the original little john and the md combining one of the most popular hook styles with gamakatsu's beefier superline offering the gamakatsu superline offset round bend delivers the strength necessary to target big fish in heavy cover. Well suited for braided line and heavier fluorocarbon, the Gamakatsu Superline Offset Round Bend is built using stronger Superline wire that allows anglers to easily fish a finesse worm around heavy cover. The Round Bend offers a larger bite area, perfect for any worm presentation, while increasing your hookup ratios. The newly enhanced Z-Band holds your plastics on the hook longer reducing the number of pull-offs and reducing damage to plastics. Available in 2-aught, 3-aught, 4-aught, and 5-aught, this is the most durable worm hook designed for heavier lines that hold your bait on longer. Preparation is key to success. And that preparation starts well before you ever hit the water. You're only as strong as your connection to the fish, and your line is that critical connection. Confidence in your line every minute of every day on the water is a necessity, and failure, it's not an option. Sunline makes the fluorocarbon, nylon, and braided lines to give you the strength to guarantee your confidence. Have you considered purchasing new electronics for your rig? The type of mounts you choose to protect your investment should be part of the decision-making process. No matter if you prefer one, two, or three graphs up front, 
Beatdown Outdoors has a solution for you. Adjustable, versatile, rigid, and made in the USA. What's your ultimate electronic setup? Check out the full selection of Beatdown Outdoors products by visiting beatdownoutdoors.com. All right, we're back. So I got a text literally a minute and a half ago. And it was none other than the man, Bradley Hallman. I was like, don't finish this. I'll be there in a minute. Who was driving past the studio, decided to jump in on the last show. Like I said, you could tell the the screen is just a tad. I guess I'll work with it. I spent a lot of time trying to get that thing. I'm taking, so you can see the the, uh, piping there, like the cage. The cage is going in the new studio, Bradley. I've always liked the cage. I've always liked the piping, the cage. Hey, there we go. Now we're yeah, up. It is, up, up, up. It is none other than Elite Series Pro, Bradley Hallman. So I, I was driving, and I was like almost near – I was actually thinking. I was starving. I was like, I was wondering if Matt's done yet with the show so we could go eat. And you had crochet on, and I was like, oh, Cliff. And then I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to make it. And then y'all kept dragging it out with the kids. And so I was like, make this last. I'll be there in a second. I thought you were talking about the show. And I can't eat afterwards because I have to take the boat. Oh, that's right. you got to go to Tulsa. Look, is that a legit blister? That's a legit blister from one end to the other. With a hair dryer? With a hair dryer. And I didn't even realize. It wasn't like one. Uh, it wasn't like one deal where I did it. And then I was like, oh, I burned my finger. It was like I was pulling the wrap off. And, you know, I was using it there. So it's an extended period of time. Wow. Yeah, not good. I can't believe you got a hair dryer that's that badass. It's I mean, on. dude, that's a. I've got a heat gun, is what I use to heat mine up with. But you have to be really careful. You'll smoke the carpet. Yeah, well, I didn't have the wrap on the inside to get near the carpet, so it worked out perfect. Not even on the inside of the gun wall. No. Cool. Good. Good no. deal. The guy who did it did a really good job. But I got like two thirds of it off. Now I have to take it up to the bass tank. Have them take the electronics off. Then I'll take it over to Shoreline. Have them do the rest of the wrap inside, yeah. and then yeah. take it up to Bass Cat, Mountain Home, Arkansas, before Christmas. I said first world problems. Yeah. You're, com- you're complaining yeah. about getting the wrap off of your high-end bass boat. Man. Dude, it is. It's the worst job on the planet. We were talking about that yesterday when you were telling me you were doing it. I was like, wow, that'd be a good YouTube video. A lot of guys don't realize, like, every year taking that thing off is terrible. And then if you run one for two years, it's like it gets baked on there. And then it just comes off in pieces. I call it picking. Like, when it all comes off in one sheet, that's cool. What you said yours did. But, like, when it starts ripping and tearing and there's all these pieces. Okay, so immediately after talking with you, the boat wrap gods decided to do that because I was able to get the top cap off, but the whole side, because there's, like, little cuts from running into stumps and fishing it, it is now coming off of it about an inch and a half at time. Yeah. It's it's, It's not fun to do that. That's what my children are for. That's what I get them out you there You make for. them do the boat wrap? Yeah, because my house looks like Cliff's. And, uh, yeah, I guess you kind of have the same thing, except you have girls and older. boys, and they're a little bit more spread out. Yeah, and they're older now, so like I, I, I get them out there in, in the garage, and I'll like have everything you know on a nice, warm day. Like If you can get it out in the sun, it's not bad, but that's never when you end up needing to do it. It's always like right now. Could you imagine having four caged, active, boys right there at pier part under the age of seven <laughs> seven five and three and the three-year-olds are twins yeah yeah that's a lot to handle whenever i first met him that's what i was thinking about when i was watching that his, when he first came on the elite series his rookie year was probably somewhere around i'm guessing here 2007 eight or nine when did we go back out to california nine fifteen well, we went in seven, and I think we went back in nine. So let's just guess it's about that two thousand. Yeah, nine, nine or ten. Frame. The one that uh, John Cruz won. Yeah, and him and him and Keith Poche both were rookies at the same time, and uh, they were young, young, and both of them out of Louisiana. So they were running together, rooming together, and they were wild men, but um, not married, single bachelors. And then to see him now, I'm like, yeah, now you're feeling some of my pain, brother. <laughs> So when I started uh, fishing with Cliff, like I said, he's a legit friend. Like we right. started getting along, but there would be these off weeks on the road, and I was single in my twenties too. And he would be like, "Matty, he called me Matty Ice because of Matt Ryan." And he'd say, "Matty Ice, you you want to fish these days?" It would just go to random fisheries, and it was cool because that's when Cliff was learning all of this new stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it was literally frogging. 
punching, right. flipping, grass, right. right. chaffalai, right. basin, yeah. like verret, you yeah. know. Yeah. He was not versatile at all. <laughs> like prided himself in lack of versatility on the water. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with that. He made he he had some good derbies doing that for sure. Uh, yeah, and continue to. Yeah. Riding riding his strengths early on is what I was talking about. Early on. Hey, while we're making lists that tick people off, did you hear the list that Cliff and I made? No. The friendliest flippers. I, I pointed out that it seems like the guys and we're not talking just and and the guys who occasionally fish shallow. We're talking about guys who if it exists a shallow bite in zero to three, they're doing the twenty five pound string, four rods, and that's what they're doing. We're talking the Greg Hackneys, that type of stuff. The friendliest flippers. So it's went, gotta start with Sam Rayburn guy, right? Well it started as all flippers have the the best, the top, all have a chip on their shoulder and are not pleasant to be around. Okay. And you were on that list. He, someone said, well, Brad seems nice. And I was like, no, you don't want to be around him when he's flipping. Like, you get a chip on your shoulder. You start, I mean. Todd Fair, Faircloth's who I was thinking would win the I've friendliest you flipper contest. literally come in from a tournament that you were flipping in and ask everybody you knew who a, different, who a boat was in the open and what rap it was because that <laughs> yeah. idiot yeah. had the audacity to find the same fish you did, yeah. and he was really screwing with your pattern, and you wanted him out of there. Yeah, that, that happens. That happens. <laughs> you get very territorial in six inches very of water. Very territorial. So, yeah. so flippers, we all do. So I said, hey, is there such a thing as a successful passive flipper? Fair cloth. No, he does too much stuff. But he is like I'm powerhouse talking, flipping. I know, but I'm talking about the guys who are always up there. You'll see Fair cloth do a bunch of different stuff. I'm talking, mm-hmm. think about it. Brower. No. Biffle, mm-hmm. Tharp, mm-hmm. you, mm-hmm. Heron, Heron. That's that's who he named. Go, mm-hmm. I mean, dude, you could go through the list of old school. Everyone has Ish. a chip on their shoulder. Ish. Yeah, it's 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 because it's six inches of water, yeah. bro. So here's the list that we came up with. I want to see if you agree. Stephen Browning, friendliest flipper. Yeah. Bill yeah. Owen. Yeah. Yeah. And John Cox, those were our top three. But I'm, I've never fished around Cox, so I, you know, there's a lot of guys that are super friendly on the bank at the boat ramp. Yeah, especially when they got twenty pounds and about yeah, to cast well, no, ten thousand check on the water. I know that's what I'm saying. You they may be that. totally I different. What is that? Need to take that. No. Have you ever heard that? Is that an Amber Alert or something? I don't know what that is. Is it an alarm? For yeah. The house. I don't know. Is it an app? Do you need to take, take No, care it's of it? a it's a wife. A wife that's like urgent, pick up, urgent, pick oh, up. Well you can go pick up if you need to. No, you're good. I'm texting now. Oh, We're rolling. Okay. I've been a part of some of your urgent calls are indeed urgent, and some of them are like Where is this? Exactly. <laughs> so I, I was like, what's up? <laughs> if it is urgent, we could wrap it up. But are you cool with that three? Now, uh Cajun Baby did not want to put Cox at the front of the list because he believed that he did too much <laughs> spinning rod and wacky rigging while up shallow, that that wasn't true power. Yeah. Um, so he, we were both comfortable with, with Stephen Browning. Yeah. I would go Browning dude. I'm telling you, Faircloth spends a lot of time up there and he's probably pretty friendly on the water as well. I know, but Faircloth also is offshore a lot and will do a lot of, deep cranking and ledge stuff and offshore stuff. And I feel like it's not Faircloth's only deal. Like Faircloth will do stuff that the guys you just named. Yeah. Biffle, Hair, uh, Brower. But, uh, you know, uh, you know who you could throw into that? That's a blast from the past. That's really nice. Very nice. Just quiet. And I think a lot of people thought of it was Terry Butcher. Would you consider him a friendly flipper? No. No, he's not pleasant to be around? He would get in fights constantly. Terry! So when he was on the Elite Series, him and Biffle fought constantly. Did they really? Yeah. Yeah. Everything good? Uh, no. She says propane smell in the house, and she's freaking out and wants to know how to turn the gas off to All right. It. Well, we're going to wrap the show up anyway, but it's a great time for you to come in. Do you have anything else or are you just driving by and wanted to stop by? No, I was just driving by thinking about eating honestly and then y'all were still going and then all the kids jumping around really got me. 
thinking. I hadn't talked to that dude in a long time. Well, but it's all right. I, I caught number. it late. Hey, yeah, no, nah, I got his number. I just, you know, right. we all get busy. It was cool seeing him on there. And uh, Give the this is the last one of the year? Yeah, so we're doing day five, uh, four tomorrow with Frank okay. Scalish. And okay, that'll so be the last one. Of the so, last yeah, this is the last one of the year. I believe this is this is crazy that how this worked out. The very first show of the year, did I not have you in studio? Um, probably. I don't know. Yeah, we did. We start, We kicked off the year together. That's and, right. The very first gonna, show of the year. Because gonna, that was your first one without Marcus. Yep. That's right. And we're going to end the year together. So yep. that worked absolutely right. perfect. Thank you for jumping in. Hey, big news. What? This is life changing for me. Dude, when you have 20, 20 Hawkeyes your entire life, and then it leaves you in your 40s, I have been lost and roaming for the last two years. Glasses, no glasses, spectacles, put sunglasses on, back to my glasses up close, to tie a knot, yeah. different things. Yeah. But but my, my, my far vision's going as well. So I just came out of the first time wearing contacts. You wear contacts, don't you? Mm-hmm. And uh, she's telling me, and she's putting them on. She's like, you never worn contacts before. This is probably not going to work. You're not going to have, like, great binocular vision, this or that or the other. By the time I was done, dude, I was reading the 2010 sheet. You have them in Not right 2020, now? not 2015, 2010. And I, she was like, I've never had anybody read it. I'm like, X, Y, Z, F. Very, very excited. Do you have them in right now? Yes. So can you read the – you can read the comments on the screen. Then. 100%. And you wouldn't – you didn't even – I would always have to, like – yeah. And so from eye doctor standpoint, like – I can see without anything to safely drive, to, to do anything. Like, my eyesight's not that bad. Matter of fact, my right eye, she's like, they don't even make a, a lens to fix what little bit your right eye is off. And my left eye is off just a little bit. So to them, to eye doctors, to like working in an office or living life, it's not a big deal. But when you go from sight fishing and like priding yourself on being extremely good at sight fishing and yeah. seeing those little edges, seeing a yeah. fin, seeing a nose of a fish sticking out from a dock, as that starts to disappear... Dude, it is bad. Yeah. And I didn't even realize it. Scott Martin and I filmed a show together down on Arbuckle a couple of years ago. And we ended up sight fishing is what we ended up doing. And Scott and I were up there and he's like, hey, come up here and catch this fish, you know, get one on video. And I got up there and it was like right before dark. So it's like low light. And I couldn't make out the damn fish. And Scott's like, it's right there. You don't see it. And I'm like, I don't freaking see it. And I got so mad. That I was sitting at the doctor's at the eye doctor the next day, mm-hmm. but then they were like, you know, your eyesight's great. It's like barely, barely off. But but that little bit of difference when you're talking about the world of bass fishing yeah, is massive, is dude. It's massive. I'm really excited right now because I could see, I could tell when I was driving, like everything looks crisp. I can see the leaves, the lines on the leaves, the water <laughs> left on the trees. It's great. You think that's left to get yeah, left a couple of fish on the table the last couple of years? Absolutely. Of and now you'll also be able to see. Elite Series guys this year that are encroaching on your area from further away. Further so away. Know, hey, I'll, be, I'll yeah. be able to read that rap. Hey. I'm not on that friendly flipper list. <laughs> Get the hell out of here. <laughs> guys, we're just going to be gone for two and a half weeks. Like I said, I have to do the studio. I have to get a bunch of stuff done. We did the same thing last year. We typically take a two-week break during the holiday season. We're going to do that same thing. We'll be back, I believe, like January 3rd. Day four is tomorrow uh, with Frank Scalish, though, so we will be back with that one. Brad, thanks for jumping on. Thanks for stopping in. Greatly appreciate it. Like I said, start the year and end the year with you in studio, and it's been a heck of a year. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Cajun Baby also, when he said he was going to do the interview in the kitchen, I was like, this is going to be really good or really bad. I thought it was wonderful. And it went really good. Aunt Penny, Aunt Pearl, that was great. Yeah, but there were always people walking by, and I was like, well, I don't know who that is. I don't know who that (laughs) is. And then you'd see like a little head and then a big if. Kids are great, dude. It was all good. All right, this has been. Another edition of BTL Bass Talk Live for Wednesday, December 14th. We'll be back day four tomorrow, and then time for the holiday break. See ya.